the last session before the break. I think we need to stand up a little bit, all right? So can you all stand up just a little bit for me? Stand, stand, stand up, stand up, stand up. Just a little bit. Do a little stretch. Do a little stretch. All right, I don't know if you can hear it. All right. All right, all right, all right, all right. So we're going to talk about a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I want to just really briefly give a big thanks to all of the speakers, all of the volunteers, all of the organizers. So let's just give one quick round of applause. Like, it's been awesome. Great job. Uh, so we've had such great speakers today. You know, I'm hopefully not, you know, I don't disappoint because, you know, everybody seems to be smarter than me. So I'll try to do my best. Um, so we're going to talk about today a little bit about time series analysis. Does anyone know time series analysis? A little bit? Okay, some people a little bit, some people know. Um, so just, with, just so you know, I've put all the slides are on GitHub, um, and this has a ton of code. So I won't be able to talk about everything, but there's a lot of code you can play with. Um, and so, I mean, I think like one of the spirits of this conference and a lot of the talks is the idea that you can be empowered to do stuff, um, you know, like using Python to drive like tunneling things and, you know, using Python to discover and map stars. Um, my talk is about how to use data for self-understanding and for like self-improvement. Um, and so these are a couple of key terms. I just want to make sure we all know these terms and so that we can kind of go a little bit faster so we know the words. So time series is a, a simple idea. The idea is that you have data that is somehow tied to an index in time. So the, I think the technical definition from 1970, a time series is a sequence of observations taken sequentially in time. And so time series, an, time series analysis is the idea that we take this time series data and we decompose it, meaning we pull out the parts that have a time pattern. And we use math and we use Python and all of these things. And sort of, there's a number of cases where we do this. So the most common example when we talk about um, time series analysis, oftentimes when you look on the internet, is around financial markets. So I was joking with one of the other speakers that I made this talk because all of the resources I found were only about trading stocks. And I wanted to be able to show how to use time series analysis for looking at our own data. Um, and so there's a number of areas where we use time series analysis. Um, and typically it's kind of like it's kind of like this. You have a number of observations, and then you try to model the effect of time to make a forecast. So my goal or one of the areas I'm working on is to use um, personal data in the health space and the quantified self space. So, you know, today we have all of these watches, we have phones, we have trackers. Um, and sort of the question is, many people are like, oh no, privacy, I'm so, I'm so nervous. But I'm sort of the other side. I think the goal is to try to become empowered by these technologies and sort of being able to use these data and these tools. And I think that's kind of the spirit of Python. Like, don't complain if it's, uh, you know, you don't complain because there's no tool there. You can build your own. And so today I want to talk a little bit about this. Um, and so there's two, there's two areas that I'm currently working on um, with myself and with some doctors. One is around what's called N of one trials. So a lot of times when we talk about science, um, we talk about big studies, you know, thousands and thousands of people. But many times today we want to do what's called individualized medicine. Um, and the only way to do individualized medicine is to understand how you have biological changes over time. And so a lot of people are using these statistical and forecasting tools to understand. Um, and then the second area, this sort of my personal interest and an area I've built a number of things in is around self-tracking. So we're talking about within individual changes. So biohackers, quantified self. Um, so this gives me to this other word. Does anybody know the word quantified self? Have you heard of this word? Yeah, good, cool, new word. So quantified self is the idea of geeks decided that they were not interested in social media. So like, I'll be honest, like social media, not really that interested. Instead, what I'm interested in is how can I use technology to make myself Superman? So like my goal, I like I want to be, maybe not Superman, Iron Man's way better, right? Like Superman kind of cheats, he gets that like, comes from another planet, like Iron Man's cool. So the quantified self, um, a kind of working definition is measuring 
or documenting something about yourself so you understand something or you can make improvement. Um, and so what I want to talk about here is how we can use Python and data to sort of um, model and understand the quantified self. Um, so I think what last year was really a lot of fun to come because many people didn't know. This time they're like, oh, I bought a wearable. I've started tracking this. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty excited to talk about maybe going beyond just tracking and how we can apply it. Um, there's another cool word, maybe you don't know this word, biohacking. Like that's, a, that's like, if you want to be cool, tell your mom you're a biohacker and she's like, what's a biohacker? So I work with biohackers in America and Europe. These are people that are using um, science and technology and tracking and even sometimes changing their DNA to, to become maybe more empowered or more productive or, you know, all kinds of different things. Um, so the quantified and self-tracking space has all kinds of different parts. And so what I work in, um, in the productivity space, the time management, and there's a big part of the quantified self that's around wearables and sensors and health. So that's what we're gonna mostly focus on today, but it's a very big space. If you go on the internet and you look up quantified self, there's you know, hundreds of apps. And so if you have any questions about how to track anything, you can ask me during the Q&A. Um, so the question I want to focus on today and sort of frame all of the code. So we're going to look at a, a number of pieces of code, but sort of the big question is how to understand like the human health or how to understand an individual self over time. Um, so the classic example is, you know, I have a friend who's like, I started working out and I got skinnier. And then at the same time, he says, he says, I got skinnier because I started working out. But I also said, but you know, that same time, you, your girlfriend, she dumped you. So she was no longer making dinner for you. And so he's like, did I lose weight because I was working out? Or did I lose weight because my girlfriend is no longer cooking for me? And so this is kind of one of the questions we're trying to understand is, over time, what's the cause of you know, human health or productivity? How can we understand this? Um, so just real quick about me. So I, uh, I'm from the United States, and I, I guess I would say that my interest is in between sort of technology and how to understand like humanity. So I'm part sort of social scientist and part technologist. Um, and what I really love about Python and you know, this community is it's very open. So everybody's like, it's one of the great things is people are trying new things. And so last year I was trying something around how to collect and visualize data, you know, one year later, I'm sort of trying to talk about how we use that data. And so professionally, I work as a software engineer. I do apps and web. But increasingly, I do a lot more data science stuff. Um, and I even had big man over there. I have a blog. I write way too much on my blog about all kinds of stuff. I've got a new kind of blogging thing. But if you're ever interested on any question around self-tracking and personal data, I've probably written something about it because uh, I have no life. So just to sort of give you my story, so my mission, you know, as we get, you know, when I was young, I was like, oh, I'm going to do it in a week, I'm going to do it in a month. But sort of now I'm under this, like, over the next several years, over the next several decades, what I'm trying to do is transform science and data into sort of better self-understanding and better self-improvement. So the idea is, you know, we have all these technologies that maybe other companies are using, but how can we use these technologies for ourselves? you know, better fitness, better relationships, um, better time management, and how can we use technology towards that? Um, and so I work on a couple of different things right now um, between, I guess, data technologies and human health. And so I work with some doctors and some companies around how to optimize health and wellness. I think we all know this, Malaysia, you know, all of Asia, all of the world, we're kind of in a, like a health crisis. Right, you know, people are more stressed, they're not sleeping, they have diabetes, all of these problems. Um, I personally believe that there's a role to play for data and technologies, but we really haven't figured it out. Um, like one of my friends was telling me, I got, a, I, got a, I got an Apple Watch, why didn't I lose any weight? Well, I'm like, you sit at home all day and watch TV. Like, the watch doesn't make you healthy, the watch supports you in becoming like, healthier. Um, the other group of people I work a lot with are quantified self people and biohackers. So these are crazy people, I mean a little bit crazy, I think they're smart crazy. They believe that maybe their doctor's job should be their own job. You know, your doctor wants to help you when you're sick, but many times biohackers, what they want to do is try to help themselves before they get sick, right? 
So they look at their data, they look at kind of the science, and they try to make changes towards positive um, health and wellness and psychology. Um, and I've built a lot of stuff. I like to just, I'm a huge supporter of open source code. Like, has anyone, anyone do any open source? Who does open source work? All right, big round of prop, like, you guys are awesome. Like, we need more open source. So next year, next year we're gonna get more people to raise their hand. But like, so personally, I'm a huge fan of the idea of like building stuff in the open. So all of the code I'm sharing, um, it all kind of started last year where, you know, I was writing code for a talk and one of my friends says, well, just make all of the code open source. And so I made it all open source and over the last year it's grown to like, I don't know, there's 200 stars on, on, on GitHub and I'm like, oh, how many people, you know? It's, you know, it's not, uh, it's not pandas, but you know, I'm doing what I can. Um, so I've got a number of, of things and so I like to build stuff. All right, so what we're gonna talk about today is, the, the title is way too long, but the idea is how to use time series data analysis with Python. And my main focus is to talk about health data. Um, so like I said, most of the data um, analysis stuff for time series is around financial data or around weather data. Um, and so it's an interesting question. Like I, my personal question was, how useful is time series analysis for health data? Um, so my objectives are basically, I wanna give you, since not that many people do about time series analysis, I wanna give you a kind of a high level understanding so you know what it is, why it's important, and some of the principles. Um, and then the second thing, I've got a lot of code. So we're not gonna go through everything, but I've created a, uh, a good, I guess, a number of Jupyter notebooks that are all about how to understand time series data and how to sort of decompose your data. And it's, it's mostly about health data, but you could actually use all of these techniques on any data set. So like maybe you have a set of data and you just wanna ask, is there a temporal effect? Hopefully this code can help you. And then at the end, we're gonna look at some modeling things. The modeling will be quite funny um, because it's kind of bad. Um, oh, you'll see why. Um, so there's a, we're gonna talk about a couple of things. We're gonna look at time, temporal structures. I'm gonna talk about a data set that I did. So I have a data set. I had a number of my biohacker friends that gave me their sleep and exercise data. So I have about 10 people. We're gonna look at their data and say, all right, here's their data. What are the patterns? And that's kind of interesting. And we're gonna look at um, time series visualization, some statistical tests, and some modeling. And then at the end, I'm gonna say, how do we apply that to our health and self data? Um, just a kind of framing thing, we're only gonna focus on like univariate um, linear models. Like time series space is huge. There's just an endless, we could talk all day about it. Um, but we're gonna keep it kind of high level and, and kind of simple. Um, so the first thing to ask, I guess, is what is time? Um, it seems like kind of a funny question, like why would we talk about, you know, time and, you know, why does that matter? Um, because, you know, we're, we're computer people. It doesn't matter reality, right? I just play with my code. I work on my computer. Um, but I have a background in philosophy, so I had the lucky opportunity when I was 19 years old to take a course on metaphysics. Um, and so if you want a course to sort of make you start thinking about the deep questions in life, um, the question about time is an interesting one. Um, and it's not actually a new one. What is time is an old question. There's this very famous um, priest and philosopher and monk called St. Augustine. And in the 400s AD, he asks, what then is time? If no one asks me, I know what it is. If I wish to explain it to him who asks, I do not know. So the idea in this quote is, is like time seems like a thing we just kind of understand, but when we try to explain it, it gets kind of weird. Um, and there's a couple of reasons why it gets weird. And it's actually interesting that we had a physics talk before, and then I guess this talk about time, because there's an interesting, I guess, problem, is that we have the idea of what physics says time is, and then we have what our, I guess I would call our subjective experience of time. And they're actually different. So like the physics of time and how you experience time, they're not the same. Um, and we kind of want them to be the same. Um, but when you think about this philosophically and you think about the history, um, I find this an interesting way to think about philosophy. Philosophy is actually all about what is timeless. So all the philosophers are like, ah, oh, this thing is timeless or the forms or that. And then what is time? Um, but there are two sort of things, if you wanna go like super geek, we can talk about that in the Q&A, but there's really two things that stand out when you look at the nature of time. 
the first is, is that time is unidirectional. It goes one way. So, I mean, we can debate that, the time travel thing. I'd love to talk about that. But as far as I know, we can only go in one direction with time. Um, whoops. What did I do? Ah. The second thing is time gives order to events. So even though this is like a physics and a psychological idea, actually this is quite important from the data science side, that time gives order to events. So those are really the two things. Even you can read all kinds of books about what is time, this is the most important. So there are a number of challenges around this, about modeling time. So what I mean by modeling, I don't mean modeling in the like data science modeling, I mean how do we understand the relationship between these two parts of time. So we have like Einstein and all of these different guys talking about what is time, the physics of time. But like I was saying, we have this weird um, difference in our subjective experience. So we actually have this experience of called time dilation. Sometimes time is slower, sometimes time is faster. And then there's this other third problem is how do we link the physics of time with the experience? They don't seem to match. Like, you know, the scientists say time's like this, but I'm like, no, no, no. I was on this romantic walk and the time was stopped, you know, like these are different experiences. So there's some good news, there's some good news. So like, what is time, all of this stuff, what's the good news? Well, the good news is because we were just talking about time series data, none of these general time patterns or general time problems matter because for us, what matters are the time challenges in our data. So I, I think it's important to think about the physics of time and all of that stuff. But fortunately, we can frame that and say, all we need to figure out is, is time important in my data? And so if we think about that, what are the time challenges? So in data science, why, why do we need to deal with time? Well, there's a couple of reasons why we need to deal with time. First, we need to understand the time component. Is there a time component? We're gonna look at some code. Like, is the changes in our data set because of something we did, or is it just changes because the time pattern? You know, the classic example is the temperature rises. Well, it didn't rise for anything because, you know, the Earth moves in a certain way. The same thing happens with a lot of our biology and health. The other thing we need to think about when we look at time series is how to isolate out time. So if we want to do a model, we want to understand something about um, something with time series data, we need to take time out. We don't want time in our data. And so we're going to look at that. We need to talk, talk about how to stationalize, so how to make our data not move. So the way to think about this, and this is kind of my way of thinking about this, is if you're trying to look at time series data, you can imagine it, it's on an index. And so when you have an index, that index has an effect on your data. Um, and so the point being is, like we said, there is a... Uh, there is a variation in time. So because it's on this time index, the time index is causing the variation. It's not just changing because of the actual variable or something else. This time is the, the variable. So what I mean by this is that part of what we're trying to do in time series analysis is to understand the time part. So like, meaning like, what are the effects of time? The order, the cycles, the pattern. So like the classic example is when you're looking at forecasting data for stocks, what you're trying to see is, you know, is there a monthly trend? Is there a yearly trend or even, even longer? Um, and so the problem comes, and this is like something my, my friends were asking me, well, why does it matter? Well, when you're trying to do modeling um, and you're trying to sort of create an understanding of your data, there are effects in your data caused by time. So if you have time effects, your data becomes non-stationary, meaning that the variance is off. So you have all kinds of variance that's a problem. So let's take a look. There's an interesting example just to sort of visualize this. Um, so we're trying to visualize the difference between stationary data and non-stationary data. So on the left, we have an example of stationary data. It doesn't look stationary, right? It's moving up and down but there's a consistent pattern. So when there's a consistent pattern, that's stationary data. As opposed to the one on the right, um, there's variation, and that variation is part of a, a time effect. Um, and this would be another example of, of, of data that's not stationary, because why? The data is going up, there's a trend. So one of the classic things we'll look at is how to detrend the data. And this is sort of another example of how, if your data is not consistent, your data is not stationary, 
then you, it's very difficult to model it because of the effects of time. Um, so just real quick, there's a lot of different things to look about, to look at what's called the internal structures of temporal data. So the effects of the time index. The first is trend. So you know, you're talking about the direction of your data. Seasonality is the idea of you have different periods of effects. Um, and so we're gonna look at that. One of the most interesting ones is about how you sleep. So most of us sleep in a, in a seven day pattern. But because of my data set, it's quite interesting. Some of them don't really have a weekend. They, you can see in their data, they end up sleeping on a Tuesday because they didn't sleep on you know, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday they go to work, and then Tuesday it's like crash. Um, so people have different seasonal effects. Um, we often have cyclical movements um, of our data. It's less, of, it's less clear, so I've been researching this for a while. These cyclical ones with biology are a bit more tricky. Um, and then the, the other one that's quite important is called serial correlation. So serial, of course, means series. Correlation means that the previous thing had an effect on the current thing. So we're trying to look at, when you look at sleep, is like, if I didn't sleep yesterday, well, today I'm probably gonna sleep more. I mean, a simple example. Um, but basically, when we look at these three or four different factors, what we're trying to do is create a model that's able to take those out so we're going to detrend our data, so then all we have left is, um, I guess, the meaningful variables. Um, and that's sort of the main goal. Um, and sort of the main word, that, they're kind of weird, I find this word weird for some reason, is stationarity. Um, the idea is what we're trying to find is stationarity in our data. And what that means is the statistical properties are consistent. So you're talking about variance, you're talking about mean, um, and there are some things we're gonna be able to do to understand that. Um, yeah, it's important. We're going to do this. Don't worry. Um, so there's a couple of different approaches to time series um, data. So just to be clear, if I skip over something, all of the slides are online. There's a ton of other stuff. I just, I just want to focus on a couple of things. So the, the thing that's important to think about when you're thinking about time series data is the first question. Is there a temporal effect? Is time important to my data? So this is like the 1970s guy who came up with this box in Jenkins. But there's a better way to visualize it. And so the first question you want to ask yourself, you know, we, I love this. I think every single talk has one of these workflow things. So I felt like it was my job to make sure I had one of those things with the arrows. So check. Uh, so the first step, really, what you want to do is you want to pre-process your data. You want to visualize it. And then the second thing you want to do is you want to check for stationarity. So you want to check, is time affecting my data? Are there patterns? So we're going to look at that. So first we're going to look at how to visualize. We're going to do some statistical checks. And then we get to the question, is my data stationary? If it's not, then we need to do some stuff. Um, if it is, then we can start building a model. Uh, just to give you a bit of a context, so there's a lot of different data sets. So I, in, the, in the code that's online, so I put it in, uh, I don't know if I said, all the code is on GitHub. But there's a number of examples that I put. Um, the code itself, there's basically general examples around how to forecast, how to do time series analysis. But individually, there are examples on how to work with your own data. Um, and so for, for my current research work, I'm working with about 25 different people in Canada. And we're using a number of different medical or self-tracking data. Um, but for this project, we're really just looking at a couple of small different things. And so we're just looking at three different wearables, two people with Fitbit, one person, an aura is a ring you wear. It's pretty cool, like the aura. Um, is a ring you wear to track yourself. It's probably the most popular one for like, biohackers. And then I have an Apple Watch, but this isn't actually my data. Um, so we're going to look at sleep, exercise, and, and activity. Um, why are we looking at that data? Um, well, first, it's easy to get that data. And there's a lot of interesting within individual variability. Um, and then, like I said, it's an interesting data set to ask, can we use time series analysis to understand that data? So the practical questions are, are there any time patterns in our data? And then secondly, can we model those, those things? Um, I'm not going to talk about this because I talked a little bit about last year. But I have an open source project nowadays that connects to um, about 20 different tracking services now. Um, so if you have, the only one I don't have is we don't have Garmin. We can, we can work on that. We have time this afternoon. 
Um, but it integrates with Fitbit, with Apple Health, the Aura. And so this is the tool I use to pull this data. Um, and it's, it's a growing little project where lots of people, what I think that I would say are people that are interested in tracking and they're also interested in data science. And so it's an interesting little project. So I use this to basically get our data. And then what I did is I pulled data from these 10 guys and then we're looking at a couple of subsets. Um, we're just gonna skip over these. The general characteristics, there's a, about a year of data from all of these different people. Um, interestingly, some people had all of their data and then some people had some missing stuff and we're gonna look at how to deal with that. Um, so the first thing, like I said, the first step around time series data analysis um, is the idea of data visualization. Um, and so I think a lot of us talked about how important you know, matplotlib or seaborn is. Um, and so we're gonna talk about this real quick. Um, the obvious question is why do we do data visualization? Because, well, it's really hard for me to go through a million lines of like, you know, star data to find anything. My brain's not good. So we use data visualization to try to get some feel for what's happening. Um, and there's a couple of different ways we can do that. Um, and when we're looking at our visualizations, we're trying to see are there trends? Is the data weird? Are there patterns? Like visually, we might be able to see that. And that's kind of the first step to then start doing some changes. Um, and then I think you guys know a lot about this, but I'll show you a quick couple examples. I mean, the most obvious one, you do a line chart, you do a histogram. But I think one of the better ones is the box and whisker plot. Um, so I'll just show you those real quick. I don't think we have time to go through all of these examples. Um, but like this is a, a data, data set about weather. And you can clearly see by plotting it this way, there's a, there's a pattern, right? Um, interestingly, when we look at our, uh, when we look at our, our health data, so this is, let me see what this is, this is sleep data. So if we look at this sleep data, there maybe is a pattern, I don't know, you see a pattern? I'm not sure, maybe, um, but this is one way to visualize it. Um, another way to look is like a histogram, but I think one of the better ways to look at it, actually this person is not the best example, um, is to do a box plot. And so what we do when we do a box plot is a fairly classic statistics. We're looking at what's in the middle, and then we're looking at what are at the two extremes, and then are there any outliers. This person's data is, I think this is my sleep. My sleep is fairly consistent. Um, but we'll look at another example in a minute. The other way to do it is, I think, is quite important when you're doing time series data analysis is to do a heat plot. The reason why we do a heat plot is we want to know where there are these holes. So this data has a bunch of different holes. We're going to have to deal with that, you know. So by visualizing the data, we know there's holes. Now we got to like fix that later. Um, and this code is pretty simple. I mean, it's not, you know, you guys are smarter than me. So just plug in the code and try it. Um, the other one that's quite important um, is called, I'll just explain the word first and then we'll come back. Um, So we're looking at this idea of autocorrelation. Um, so autocorrelation is the idea, not auto like automatic, but auto as in self, right? So we're looking at if, you know, T1 is related to T, you know, T, right? Or, or T is related to T negative one. And so this is a very important function to sort of check, is there a lag? You know, was today's sleep or today's exercise important to the last one? Um, and there's, all of this code really, for most of the time series data analysis, I, didn't, I don't really have the time to talk about it, but it's all from the stats model. Because mostly what we're looking at is like statistical things. Um, and so this example is just a simple like, you know, we've got a for loop, we go in and we subplot based on is the lag. This is not a very clear example if there is anything. Some of the other ones are better. Um, but the autocorrelation one, let me just show you what it looks like. So this is very standard data from some temperature range. So this would be clearly an example of like, when we look at the autocorrelation, right, there's some, there's some lag effects and it goes in these patterns. And so this is a pretty good visual. We do this directly from pandas, you know, love pandas. Thank you, Wes. Um, and then this is another example of someone else, right? Is there, is there any correlation between their, their sleep over time? Doesn't, doesn't appear like it does. Um, all right. So just to sort of walk back, so we said there's a couple of different ways to look at our data visualization. 
But what we really want to do is we want to make sure that we do statistical tests to know if this is actually true. Um, so we just looked at the autocorrelation function. But the one I want to talk about is this called the Dickey-Fuller test. Um, and this is also part of the stats model. Um, there's a couple of examples you can look at. Um, just to show you, this is an interesting example. This person, I can't remember who it is now, but this person has an, a, a lag. So one of the interesting observations from looking at all this data is some people have temporal patterns and some people don't. Um, so the, the way to run this code is pretty simple. You, you use the stats model, you import it, and then you just toss in either you know, a data frame column or you just use a series. Um, and then you get these nice little patterns, you know, and you can see from this data I think I took this example from stock prices like stock prices show a clear correlation between yesterday's price and today um, Like you can see it's like almost hundred um, percent But the automated Dickies test is basically a way to check if that process has serial correlation um, and just to be clear, because sometimes these things are not always um, understandable, the test statistic, what we're trying to find, is it needs to be negative. If the data is not, if it's not negative, that means there's more temporal effects. Um, but you can try this, try this yourself. But the basic idea is we run this test over and over again until we've sort of transformed our data into something else. This is the data I started with. And then I ran this test and we see actually it's not negative yet. Um, and then what we see is actually the critical values are lower than the test statistic. And so what does that mean? That basically means that our data is not stationary. And when it's not stationary, we need to like change the data. So the first question we were talking about is our health data stationary? Well, we ran, I ran these tests on a bunch of different people and it appears that for some people there is no correlation and some people there is. Uh, and some people there's more, and some people there's less. But one of the interesting things is when I ran the statistical test, actually, surprisingly, there was no temporal effect. We'll just skip over these. So what does this mean? Uh, the good thing is our health data, at least for like the 10 people I looked at, was generally stationary. So that's actually a, a good thing, but also kind of a confusing thing, because what we expected was we expected some temporal effects. Um, some of the other interesting things was there's individual differences. So some people show different patterns. So if we're trying to talk about health and data, we need to be clear that many times we're not trying to solve for everyone, we're trying to solve for you. And so when I'm trying to build these models now is we need to try to start to individualize. Um, the second thing that's interesting as well is that outliers really cause a number of problems. I didn't talk about how I dealt with outliers, but you can check the code. Um, but the idea being that outliers have, can have a pretty bad effect on your modeling. Um, I'm going to skip over this, but there's a number of techniques you can use to detrend your data. There's a ton of code um, to look at, but basically what you're trying to do is to take out the time effect, and so you're, you're coming up takes out the time effect and so that you're left with a, a clean stationary data set. All right, so I just want to give you a quick, a quick look at modeling. So my talk's really not focused about modeling. Um, I mean, that's super interesting and what I'm trying to work towards. I mean, our main focus in this project was to understand if there was a time effect. And I think that's still super important before you start getting excited. Um, you need to think about, is there a temporal effect? What is it? How to quantify it? And I think for our data set, it was quite fascinating to see that some people had more and some people had less. And so it's like an open problem. Um, but there's a number of great modeling tools and forecasting tools. The most famous one, um, and I'll walk through the code really fast, is called the ARIMA model. So it's all about auto regression, integrated moving average. Ooh, nice, sexy word, right? Put it on a t-shirt. Um, but the basic idea is this is a model of models. So the moving average means there's a trend. And so we, we basically try to model the trend, and then the autoregression means the serial correlation. So these are two parts, and then the third part is this integrated. What this is doing is it's checking how many times we run it. Um, there's a, a pretty standard notation, notation how to work it. So when you run the arena, if you run it in R and you run it in Python or whatever, there's three parameters. There's the lag, 
So how often you need to think about the autocorrelation, the number of times you difference it, meaning that you're resampling the data, and then the last one is the size of the moving average. Um, this is actually a very important slide. If you've never done time series data analysis, it took me months of studying before I got to this one, because this, this is basically talking about what does the data do and what model you should use. So this is the idea being that, so the first one says white noise. So the model is white noise, meaning there's no temporal effect. But when you're looking at these other examples, these are the parameters you use to try to take account of the other stuff. So if you want to save yourself like, you know, mental confusion, look this one up. Um, just to briefly show you, the code's pretty simple as well. Unfortunately, it's one of these things, right, when the, the code is so simple, you don't always learn what's going on. Um, but this is the code to sort of do a classic model like for the stats model, right? So we put in the data, we then decide the ARIMA parameters. So the order is, you know, there's a lag of two um, and stuff like that. All right, let me, just, let me just show you one more thing. So of course, being Python, someone's like, I don't want to rerun the model nine times. So I'm going to create a way to auto ARIMA. So this is another cool project you can check out. Um, it's called PMD ARIMA. And basically what this does is um, it runs the classical ARIMA model, but it runs it, I guess, nine times, and it checks all of the statistical properties to try to auto-find your, your data. Um, so you can just copy this code. I mean, it's the basic idea. You're going to run through your data. You're going to check if the, you can't see it because it's black, but it runs the model, and then it decides, all right, boom, that's your best data. Um, well, here's our data. So this is the one we looked at for the example. It's sort of okay, right? Um, real quick, there's another great project you can check out from Facebook called Profits. It's a bit magical. It's a bit black box. Um, but it does a pretty good job with temporal data as well. The, the two things about this one is you need to throw it in. Um, the data frame needs to have these two formats, DS and Y. And then it actually does a much better job of mapping. So just to go back to the main question is, when we did the data visualization, we didn't see any clear patterns, but we did see some interesting individual effects. When we ran the statistical analysis, we actually found that our data was largely stationary, which is good. That means we didn't have to do the same sort of work. Um, but we did see the potential to actually think about the lag as a different thing. So if we ran the ARIMA, the code we just looked at, um, it gave us this weird one. I mean, obviously, you probably, if you don't know it, you don't understand it, but ARIMA basically decided there was no temporal effect. So when we ran these models on all of these different data sets, we found that there was really no way in our health data to model because there was no time effect. So what it did, this is always one of these things like, yeah, it's going to work. No, it didn't. So basically what our model found was the best way to predict our data was to use the average. Exciting, right? Uh, but that's what that model ended up coming up with. And actually, if we look at um, the reasons why this happened, well, it's firstly overly sensitive to outliers. So we, we basically needed to sort of figure out a way to understand outliers without screwing up the model. Um, the other thing we learned is sometimes no model is the best model. Um, but briefly, we, I just show you, I threw it into profit, just as a comparison. Um, and we see that they did a couple of interesting things. First, it did a better job of mapping the weekly trends. But when you look at this data, right, so this is 429.2 minutes a night. Well, the trend is going to move you over the next year to 430.2. You're going to get one minute of sleep extra. Big model, right? It's powerful. Well, we'll get there. Um, we looked at some other people, though. So interestingly, other people, so this guy had less data. So there was about 40 data sets missing. And so then, of course, the model screwed up. It's, it's going to, over the next year, imagine this guy's going to start sleeping three hours extra a night. All right, real quick, key takeaways. Check your data if it has temporal effects. Number two, use the statistical te test. Visualize your data to check if it's stationary. Um, the last thing, so I'm a, a biohacker. I believe that the idea is health data technology can be extremely powerful, but the amazing thing and the thing that I'm learning and the thing I'm learning with my, my friends and fellow hackers is 
there's no such thing as universal health advice. I mean, there's a few things. Don't smoke, right? Don't smoke. But besides that, there's a lot of very interesting things happening in your data, and it's your data. Um, unfortunately, big challenges remain. There's not a lot of companies, that, that, like, there's no Goldman Sachs funding me to research this stuff, but like, tell Goldman Sachs, I'd love to work with them on data visualization for health, all for it. But you can. So I put all this code online. I'm a big believer in like tracking yourself, and the code's open source. It's really an exciting time um, to start getting your data, using your data towards your own data-driven world. So like I said, we live in a world of devices, tracking tech, and data. It's time to build a healthier world with technology and data with it. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, for the presentation.